Uh, yeah, let's praise God. Good morning. My name is uh, TJ. I am the uh, growth pastor here at Cross Church. And as PV said, we are closing out our Summer of Psalm series today. I'm super excited about that uh, this morning. And I, I'm a person who, who really likes a good story, right? I love, I love novels. I love movies. And what I really love about those is, is the story. And one of the key aspects of a good story is a good ending. Right? You can't have a good story, even if the whole thing's great. If you get to the end and it's terrible, you're like, oh, no, it didn't work for me. The ending has to be great, and, and it's one of the keys. And so it's important to have a good ending. And some good endings end with a twist where you're like, oh, my goodness, I didn't see that coming. Some uh, good endings are, are open-ended where it kind of makes you think about what came before. And some endings are just a, a perfect review, a perfect encapsulation of everything that has gone before. But no matter what, the ending is really important. And often the ending to a story is, uh, helps us to understand the whole. That we get to the end and it helps us to think back over everything that has gone before and understand it more deeply. It gives us important information to reiterate. And so as we come to our, the close of our Summer of Psalms series, we're going to look at the very end of the book of Psalms, the last psalm in there, Psalm 150. And I think that it's a really great ending because it helps us to understand everything that has gone before. And I, I've really enjoyed this series. It's been really great looking at all of these various different psalms. And I hope that you have been encouraged in that, that you've been strengthened in your faith, that you've seen God in a new light. Maybe you've seen your, your circumstances, your life in a new light. Because we've looked at all of these ways. One of the things we've said throughout this series is that, that psalms help us to look at all of these ways that we can worship God, that we can have a relationship with God throughout every area of life. In the highest of our highs and the lowest of our lows, we can follow God, we can worship God, we can trust God in all that we do. And so as we come to the end, what, what we're going to see is that the, the final word in Psalms, the final idea, the thing that we want to leave the Psalms with is praise, right? This is not a new concept. It's something that has been seen all throughout it, but it, it reviews everything that has gone before, and it says, here's what's most important. Here's the thing you need to leave with, and that is praise. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting about the book of Psalms that you might not uh, think about is that the order of the book of Psalms matters, because Psalms is, you know, there, there's all these different songs and poems and prayers all throughout it, and, and so you might think, well, well, somebody just, I don't know, grabbed a bunch of these poems and kind of put them in a bag and shook them up and then put them out, and that's how the order ended up. But actually, no, it, it was intentional, it was purposeful, the way that the book was arranged, and it was arranged in order to tell a story to tell a story about following God and what a faithful follower of God is like, to tell a story about a coming Messiah who would, who would save Israel, and ultimately to tell a story about how we can respond to God. And so when we come to the end, we see that it was purposeful to end with praise. And I want to show you how this looks because you can see it really clearly in the text. So the last five Psalms, Psalm 146 through 150, all have the same structure. And so this is maybe like a little bit too technical for just like two seconds and then we'll, we'll move on. But uh, so let, let's look at it. So Psalm 146 verse 1, I think we're going to have it on the screen. It begins with this phrase, praise the Lord. Okay, got that? Everybody, everybody good? Praise the Lord. Okay, now let's look at Psalm 146, verse 10. So this is the last verse, and it ends, praise the Lord. Everybody, have we seen that somewhere else? Right. Yes, we just saw it at the very beginning, praise the Lord. And it's the same in Psalm 147. It begins with that exact phrase, praise the Lord. And it ends with that exact phrase, praise the Lord. Psalm 148, Psalm 149, Psalm 150, all the same. It begins and ends with praise the Lord. And what it's showing us is that in all of our life, from the beginning to the end, we are called to praise the Lord. Amen. And that's what Psalms wants us to leave with, is that we are to live a life of praise. Amen. And that's what I want us to think about today as we, we go out into our lives. What does it look like for us to live a life of praise? Because ultimately, that is what the book of Psalms is about. If we want to truly follow God, to have a relationship with God, then we are going to live 
a life of praise. And so we're going to look more deeply at Psalm 150 to see what this looks like. And as we prepare to read it together, I'd like for us to pray to receive uh, God's word today. So let's pray together. If you'll repeat after me, uh, Father, open my eyes that I might see. Open my ears that I might hear. Open my mind that I might understand. And open my heart that I might receive, receive. which you have for me today. today. Amen. 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 And so let's read Psalm 150. It begins, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I I hope you noticed what's important in this psalm. It's praise. It begins, as we said, with praise the Lord, and it ends with praise the Lord. And all throughout, every single line begins with the word praise, that we are called to be a people of praise from the beginning to the end. At every moment of the day, we praise God. And what does this praise look like? I think the first thing we see here in this passage is that praising God is exciting. That as you read this, as I read this, I get the, the more I go through it, the more excited I get about it, that you can just feel the excitement about what it means to praise God. And we see that even in the actions that, that uh, the psalmist is talking about here. He's saying, you know, praise him with the ram's horn, praise him with the lyre and the harp, with the instruments, praise him with dancing, praise him with all of these things. And so it's all about this excitement that we get when we praise God and how we show that through the way that we act. And so we praise God with excitement. And we look specifically at that phrase, praise the Lord. That's actually a word that you probably know. It's hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And what that word is specifically talking about is the idea of of cheering, of screaming, of, of singing, of getting so excited in praise of God. It, uh, it, it brings to mind for me uh, a, a, like a screaming crowd of teenage girls at a Taylor Swift concert, right? Just like going crazy, you know? Or maybe uh, at a sporting event, at a football game where, where the crowd is just like going wild. I was, I was thinking about, uh, I'm a big um, Kentucky basketball fan. I, I was born in Kentucky, uh, but I actually grew up in Indiana. And so my dad one time uh, took me to an IU Kentucky game at Assembly Hall where IU plays. And if you've never been there, it's the, the, the way that the, the arena is built. It's like really steep going down. It almost feels like you're going to fall. But what that does is it makes you feel like you're like right next to the court, like everybody's packed in and it was totally packed and it was super loud and it was a really good game and it came down to a last second shot and at the very end IU makes a three-pointer three-point buzzer beater to beat Kentucky so I was a little bit bummed but the crowd went crazy and when I say crazy I mean like this was the loudest thing I have ever experienced in my life like the they they rushed the court the bands playing the fight song it was so loud and that I think is the energy that praise the Lord is bringing to our lives. When the Bible says praise the Lord, it's talking about that kind of excitement, that kind of of joy, that kind of worship of God. And I think the question that we need to ask is, is why don't we? Why don't we praise God with that kind of excitement? And I, I think maybe part of the answer is like, uh, society and context, and it's, it's normal, right? It's normal to scream your head off when you're surrounded by 10,000 other people screaming their heads off. <laughs> and maybe it's not as normal when we're here in church, but, but why not? Why can't it be? Why don't we step out beyond what's comfortable or socially acceptable to worship God with excitement, to get excited about what God is doing? I think we're worried about how our excitement will be received. Maybe you, if something, God does something amazing in your life and you're like, yes, this is awesome. And, and then you go to work and your coworker asks you how your weekend was and you say, it was good. 
You know, and you don't, you don't respond with excitement because you're not really sure how they're going to respond to you. Are they going to be excited with me? Are they going to think that I'm, I'm weird or out there or whatever? And so we don't respond with excitement. We don't praise God with excitement because we're worried about what other people think. Uh, when, when I was growing up, I, uh, I, I liked a, uh, a super, super 90s Christian band called DC Talk. You may be familiar with them. And uh, they had a, a, an album called Jesus Freak and a song called Jesus Freak. And it, it said, uh, I don't really care if they label me a Jesus Freak. There ain't no disguise in the truth. And the idea is, hey, like it doesn't matter what you think about me if you think that I'm like too crazy or too passionate for Jesus because I am. That is the truth. And I think sometimes we should recapture that. That it doesn't matter what other people think or how they're going to label us, but we should be passionately worshiping Jesus all the time. Amen. We can also think of the example of David, right? We talked about this a couple weeks ago when David brings the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, when, when God's presence re-enters the temple. David is so excited that he is dancing down the street. It says he's dancing with all of his might, and do we ever do that? Do you ever dance with all of your might about something that God has done in your life? Where you just go crazy, you're so excited. And in fact, he did it so much, he was so excited and danced so hard that his wife was judging him for it. As she comes and she says, hey, you shouldn't have done that. That was not good for the king of Israel to do. And this is how David responds. He says, yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes because of what God has done. That David is willing to look foolish, to go outside of his comfort zone to worship God because he loves God and he wants to celebrate what God is doing in his life and the life of Israel. And I think that that's key. The love part of it is key because I was thinking about myself and I'm, I'm generally like a pretty, pretty reserved person. Like when I'm not the person at the sporting event screaming my head off, when I watch my kids play sports, I'm usually encouraging them like this, like, hey, good job, way to go, like real quiet. But if, they, if I really feel like, hey, they're, they're down and they need some encouragement or they do something really awesome and I think, hey, they really want me to encourage them, man, I will go crazy and I will yell and I do not care who hears because I love them and I want them to know that they are loved. And it's the same thing with God, that we, if we love God and we want God to know that we love him, then we have to be willing to go outside of our comfort zone to get excited about what God is doing in our lives. And so we worship God and we praise God because praising God is exciting. And I think that we do that in part because it's the right response to what God has done for us. As we look at this text in, in verse 2, it says, Praise God for his mighty works. Praise him for his unequaled greatness. It's saying because of God's mighty works, because of his unequaled greatness, we should praise him, that this is the right response to what God has done and who God is, is praise. And I think one of the other reasons that maybe we don't get as excited as we, we ought to or we don't praise God the way that we ought to is because maybe we for whatever reason, whether it's circumstances in our life or things that we're going through that, that we just don't, aren't really sure if God really is deserving of that praise. That we think, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure God is keeping his promise in my life. I'm not, really sh I'm not really sure why God is allowing evil in my life. I'm not really sure why God feels distant from me. And so maybe I shouldn't be praising him. Maybe I, maybe I just can't muster up the excitement because I don't know if God is good and if he's good in my life. And I think that sometimes our circumstances, our present circumstances, can cloud our view of God. And when our present circumstances cloud our view of God, I think what we have to do is we have to look to the past and we have to look to the future. And I think that that's what scripture is for, that one of the main functions of the Bible is to remind us of what is true when we are having a hard time believing it. And so we look at the book of Psalms and it tells us about why we should praise God because of what he has done in the past and what he is going to do in the future. That all that he has done in the life of Israel and in the history of the world and in my own life and all that he is going to do to set everything right and to restore all things, that all of that is why I should praise God. And I have to remind myself over and over even when I don't see it. And so I wanted to 
to do a little of that as we look at these last few psalms in this book, that each of these is all about praise, and it gives all of these reasons for why we should praise God. And so I just wanted to read a selection of them for us. So here are some reasons that we should praise God from Psalms 146 through 150. First, God helps humanity. Uh, He helps us. Second, God created heaven and earth and everything else. God keeps his promises. God gives justice to the oppressed. He feeds the hungry, he frees the prisoners, and he makes the blind see. God protects strangers, widows, and orphans. God frustrates the plans of the wicked. God heals the brokenhearted. God knows the name of every star in the sky. God has all power, and he understands things beyond our comprehension. God supports the humble. God makes it rain. God feeds the animals. God protects our families and blesses our children. God has revealed himself to us in his word. God makes peace in the world. God creates order in the world. God honors those who are faithful to him. He delights in his people. He gives the humble victory. For all of these reasons and a million more, shouldn't we praise God? He is an amazing God, and he has done so many great things, and he is worthy of our praise, and so we should praise him for who he is, because praise is the right response to what God has done in the world and in our lives. And so I'd like to try something, something that's going to require some participation from the congregation. So I hope you're with me. Uh, so here, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to just practice, to do some praising of God together. And so if, if uh, some people would be willing to just kind of shout out like a one-sentence testimony, and then we're all going to praise God together for what God has done in that person's life. Okay? Does that sound good? All right. All right. And remember, we talked about praising God is exciting, so let's get excited. So somebody, who, who's willing to share a one, one-sentence testimony of what God has done? What would you say? Praise him for healing. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. All right. Somebody else. Praise him for your wife. All right. Good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. Beverly. Yeah, amen. For rescuing her family. Good, good, good. Anybody else? Renewing of the mind. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Deliverance from trauma. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, ma'am. For new clients. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right. We got one more. Being so blessed. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And I, I, what I want us to see, I think, is that all of these things, those were all different things. They're from, from, from big things to small things to, to uh, long-term things to short-term things. It's all over the place that we can praise God for so many things in our lives. And so because praising God is the right response to what he has done in our lives. And the last thing that I want us to see today is that praising God is your purpose, that we were created in order to praise God. It is something that that he made us for. Uh, In writing about this psalm, there's a a theologian named Walter Brueggemann, and he has this quote that I I thought was helpful in this idea. He says, uh, the outcome of life under God's law is unencumbered praise. The expectation of the Old Testament is not ultimately obedience, but adoration. And I think what he means is this, that we go all the way back to Psalm 1, the very beginning of Psalms. Psalm 1 is all about this choice that we make, this choice to follow God and follow his way or to follow ourselves and and other people and, and their way. And if we follow God's way, it says that we meditate on the law day and night. And we talked about how that's kind of an introduction to all of Psalms. And all of Psalms is answering this question, what does it look like if we're the kind of person who meditates on God's law day and night? And ultimately, what we see is if we are that kind of person, that what we arrive at is praise. And so we meditate on God's law, not first and foremost in order to be able to do the law, but in order to love the giver of the law. 
And so we, we do God's law because we love him, but the primary thing that God's law is leading us toward is love of God and praise of God and adoration of God. And so that is the purpose that he has created us for, the purpose that he has given us his word. I love verse 6. It says, let everything that breathes, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I like this detail because it reminds me of something fundamental, which is that I only have breath because God gave it to me. Amen. That in the garden, God breathed breath into Adam. And my most basic human functioning is a gift of God. And it is a gift of God that was given to me for a purpose. That God literally made me with the capacity to speak and sing his praise with the breath that he has given me. I was made to praise God, that I was created with the ability and the opportunity to praise God. This is what he has made me for. Our purpose in life is to give God praise. And that's not just what we were made for, but it's also what we were called to. That he has called us to this purpose. Um, a while ago, there's a, uh, this company that makes uh, shirts makes like t-shirts and the proceeds go to foster care. And uh, they actually asked my wife Carly uh, to be a brand ambassador for them. I, uh, I'm realizing now that I forgot to ask her that it was okay that I shared this, so I hope it's okay. Uh, so this company asked Carly to be a brand ambassador. And what they basically did was they said, hey, we're going to send you some of our shirts and uh, we just want you to kind of uh, post about it on Instagram and let everybody know about our shirts and about our company and, and kind of what we're trying to do that they had called her for a purpose, and the purpose was for her to spread the good news about what their company was doing. But can you imagine if Carly said, okay, yeah, sure, I'll do that, uh, and she received the, sh the gift of the shirts, and she just like put the shirts in the drawer and never did anything with it? What do you think they would do? They'd be like, well, hey, you didn't, you didn't achieve the purpose that you were called for, that we asked you to do this for a reason, and you didn't do it. And I think in the same way, God has chosen us as the church for the purpose of spreading his praise all throughout the earth. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God chose us as a people, as a church, in order that we can spread the good news of the goodness of God, that we can praise God all throughout the world, that we were chosen as ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5 said that we are ambassadors for Christ, to go and to praise God all throughout the earth to let other people know about what God is doing. And God has given us gifts in order to do that, that he has blessed us with all that we have and he has gifted us for ministry so that we can spread the, his praise all throughout the earth. But I think too often we hide our gifts, we put them in the drawer or we use them just for ourselves, but God has not called us to that. He has called us to a purpose of praising him, not just to ourselves, but to the world. We were made to praise God. Amen. Praising God is your purpose. And all of this psalm is about how we praise God and what God has called us to do in praising him. And so uh, as we close, the, the band can go ahead and come back up. And, and I just want to go back to our, our list of reasons. So we, had, uh, we, we looked at this list of reasons that we can praise God from Psalm 146 through 150, and all of these amazing things that God has done. And I think that that is a, a great list, but it's a list that falls short. And it's a list that falls short for this reason, because it doesn't include the greatest reason that we have to praise God and to worship God. And that reason is a person, and that person's name is Jesus. If we think about all that God has done in the past, all that God has done in the Old Testament, that enough uh, would make him worthy of praise. But God didn't stop there. That, that the, the, the story of God doesn't end in the Old Testament, but it comes through to Jesus. And in Jesus, God himself came into the world to be with humanity. Right. Doesn't that make him worthy yeah. of praise? That's amazing that Jesus has done that. Yeah. But he didn't 
stop there and just coming to be with us, but he lived a life that showed us what God is like. The Bible says that, that Jesus has revealed God to us, and that too is amazing and worthy of our praise. But Jesus didn't stop there and just come and live a life and then go back to heaven, but Jesus actually died. He gave up his life for us. He voluntarily, willingly went to the cross for you and I. That is amazing. That is worthy of our praise. But Jesus didn't stop there, that his sacrifice was actually the thing that took care of our sin and our sin problem and made a way for us to have a right relationship with God again so that we can be with him for all eternity. But he didn't stop there. He continued and he didn't stay dead and he rose from the grave so that he could have all glory and all power for all eternity. And that makes him worthy of our praise. But he didn't stop there. He sent us his spirit so that God now lives in us to lead us and to guide us and to show us what it means to live. But he didn't stop there. And he's coming again. And he's going to make all things new. And finally and completely, when heaven comes to earth and there is no more death and no more crying and no more pain, that God is worthy of our praise because of all that he has done in Jesus. Hallelujah. And so we worship God because of Jesus. And what's amazing about this, I think, is that Jesus himself talks about his purpose. And Jesus says that his purpose was to bring glory to God, to bring about praise in the world. In John 17, 4, Jesus says, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus came into this world to do a work, to live and to die and to rise again. And he completed that work. And in that work, he brought glory to God and praise to God. And so now we join him and all the other saints for all eternity in praising God because that is what he made us for. And so I'm going to pray we're going to praise God together. We're going to have an opportunity to, to respond after that. But, but right now, let's just focus and let's, let's praise God for all that he has done for us in Jesus. Father God, you are so good. And you are so mighty and you are so great. And you have done so many amazing things. So many things that we've mentioned this morning and so many more things that we can't even say or imagine beyond what we can even list. God, ultimately, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for how wonderful he is, how good he is, and how amazing it is that he came to give us a relationship with you. So God, I pray that we would respond in praise we would worship you for who you are for what you've done help us to live a life of praise to not get bogged down in our circumstances or in fear of others but to, to, to praise you with all that we have to love you with all that we have it's in Jesus name that we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit amen amen everyone say hallelujah Amen, amen.